This webinar will be presented by Dr. Mohammed Nazma Saqib, and we will also be and he, we will also be hosting his supervisor, Dr. Peter Hall. Uh, Dr. Saqib is a postdoctoral research fellow in the School of Public Health Sciences at the University of Waterloo. He's also a foreign trained physician from Bangladesh. His research interests involve bidirectional relationships between adiposity and brain health, as well as neural modulation technologies. And Dr. Hall is a professor in the School of Public Health Sciences at Waterloo with a research emphasis on brain health, translational neuroscience, and behavioral aspects of disease uh, prevention. So now I will pass it along to our uh, our presenters and specifically Dr. Saqib to start. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you everyone for joining in today and good afternoon. Today I'm going to present my research on the bidirectional associations between adiposity and cognitive function. Uh, at first, I'd like to thank for this opportunity to present my research on the CLSO webinar series. So as I mentioned, I'll uh, show you uh, some of our recent findings from the CLSA and ABCD data analysis. So there are a lot of topics to cover. So without further ado, let's uh, get into it. So this is the agenda for today. So at first I will give you some background information from the literature. Then I will discuss study one and two where we examined bidirectional associations uh, between adiposity and cognitive function using CLSA data sets. So uh, study one is the cross-sectional analysis of the CLSA uh, baseline data set. And study two is the prospective analysis of the CLSA baseline and first follow-up data set. In the general discussion section, I'll uh, show you uh, some major findings from study one and two, and as well as I'll discuss some strength and limitations. And finally, uh, at the end, I'll show you some of our recent findings from the ABCD data analysis uh, where we examined bidirectional association uh, among adolescent population. Okay, let's uh, move on to uh, background discussion. So let's talk about uh, obesity and its connection with cognitive function for a minute. So uh, the term adiposity indicates the degree of body fat accumulation, whereas, uh, whereas obesity indicates excessive fat accumulation that presents a risk to health. Obesity is a public health concern because it, in, it increases the risk of other chronic diseases as, uh, as well as death. Um, in literature, it was reported that uh, obesity increases the risk of some other chronic diseases, for example, metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, even it can cause premature death. Besides contributing to the development of these chronic diseases, obesity can adversely effect cognitive function. Now, it was reported that obese individuals tend to have lower executive function, poor memory. They tend to perform poor on neurocognitive tasks. And, and long-standing obesity can also increase the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease in late life. So how can we measure uh, adiposity? So there are a number of uh, different accepted measures of adiposity, and each measure has its own advantages and limitations. Body mass index, it's the measure of weight adjusted for height. One, uh, and it is calculated as weight in kilogram divided by height in meters, meter square. One limitation of body mass index is that it does not account for muscle mass in an individual. Therefore, it tends to overestimate adiposity in individuals who have higher muscle mass, for example, athletes. Also, it is not a very good me measure of central adiposity. So waist circumference, it's a good measure of central adiposity, but uh, one problem with this measure is that there are a number of different measurement sites reported in the literature. I think eight different measurement sites are reported and which could be problematic to compare central adiposity across studies. Next, waist to hip ratio. This is also a proxy measure of central adiposity. And again, as because it's a ratio of waist circumference and hip circumference, so this also can be influenced by different measurement sites of uh, uh, waist circumference. And dual energy extra absorptiometry, or DX in short, uh, it is often considered as a gold standard to measure fat mass. Uh, one problem is that it's, it requires expensive instrument uh, and time consuming, therefore it may not be suitable uh, to use routinely in uh, research and clinical settings. 
Okay, now I would like to discuss two important concepts uh, related to the bidirectionality. One is called brainy's outcome perspective, and the other one is brainy's predictor perspective. So let's look at the brainy's outcome perspective first. So in brainy's outcome perspective, brain is considered as the outcome or uh, end result or consequence of adverse cell condition. For example, if an individual have uh, adverse cell condition like uncontrolled diabetes or hypertension, it could lead to cognitive impairment in future. So this is an example of brain as outcome perspective. So in the context of uh, uh, today's discussion, we can think brain as outcome perspective as an idea that baseline obesity predicts future cognitive impairments. A number of longitudinal and cross-sectional study actually showed evidence for the existence of this brain as outcome uh, perspective. And in medical literature, this view actually is predominant and is and brain health is almost always considered as an outcome of adverse cell condition. Previous, as, as I mentioned, previous studies showed uh, existence for showed evidence for the existence of this uh, brain as outcome perspective, and those studies reported that this association is predominantly observed in the domain of executive function, attention, and memory. So executive function has several domains, for example, inhibitory control, working memory, cognitive flexibility, and each of the each of these domain can be affected by uh, the adverse effect of uh, adiposity, excess adiposity. Previous studies also reported that if individuals have uh, obesity in midlife, it can substantially increase the risk of dementia and Alzheimer's disease in late life. So it actually further strengthens the evidence for the existence of uh, brain as outcome perspective. So as I mentioned, uh, in literature, uh, there are abundant evidence for the existence of this brain as outcome perspective and meta-analysis of those studies also revealed similar finding. So one meta-analysis by Young and colleague, this studies, uh, this meta-analysis reported that obese, participant, obese participants uh, showed broad impairment in all domain of executive function, including inhibition, cognitive flexibility, and working memory, as well as uh, they showed impairment in some other cognitive domains, for example, verbal fluency, uh, decision making, and planning. So in that meta-analysis, meta you can see uh, obvious individual, uh, they showed uh, lower control in the inhibitory control domain of the executive function compared to their normal uh, weight counterpart. Okay, that's all about uh, brain as outcome perspective. Now let's move on to brain as predictor perspective. So in brain as predictor perspective, uh, brain is considered as a predictor of adverse uh, health condition. For example, if uh, individuals have uh, cognitive impairment, uh, for example, executive function de deficit, it could lead to unhealthy lifestyle, uh, for example, sedentary behavior or unhealthy food choices. And in the long run, it could lead to the development of overweight and obesity. So this is an example of brain as predictor perspective. So in the context of today's discussion, we can see brain as predictor uh, perspective as an idea that baseline cognitive impairments uh, predict future weight gain. This view is less well explored in previous literature. However, a number of uh, small scale studies and experimental studies showed evidence for the existence of this brain as predictor uh, uh, path. It is believed that a region of the brain called prefrontal cortex, uh, which contain major nodes of executive function, plays a significant role. In experimental studies, uh, it was uh, shown that if individuals, uh, if uh, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that contain executive, executive function is suppressed by inhibitory brain stimulation, it can result in increased consumption of calorie dense food. You can see in the figure. So this is the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex that contain major nodes of executive function. So experimentally suppressing this region of the brain using suppressive brain stimulation can result in increased consumption of the calorie dense food. So this basically suggests that if individuals have impact executive function, it could lead to the development of obesity by facilitating unhealthy dietary choices. Epidemiological studies also showed similar finding. If individuals have lower executive function at baseline, they tend to present with higher adiposity at follow-up. Okay, now I'd like to show you two studies from our lab that demonstrated the existence of brain as a predictor path. So this study by Loi and colleague, 
published from our prevention neuroscience laboratory in 2018 in neuroimage so in that study 28 female uh, right handed individual were recruited in the study and they received both uh, both stimulatory and inhibitory brains and they received both active and sham uh, ctbs brain stimulation so for your information ctbs or continuous theta bus stimulation is a suppressive variant of brain stimulation that can temporarily reduce the cortical excitability so in that study uh, it was shown that individuals after uh, active ctbs brain stimulation that temporarily suppress executive function uh, results in increased consumption of appetitive uh, food but there is no changes uh, uh, on the uh, control non appetitive food. So this study actually suggests that CTBS induced attenuation of the left, left DLPFC increased appetitive uh, snack food consumption. So uh, this is another study from our lab by Sapathy and Hall. So this study was published in Brain Stimulation in 2019. So in that study, the joint effects of contextual cues and CTBS on eating were examined. So for that study, uh, 107 participants were recruited and they were randomized into four different study conditions. So conditions are sh yeah, sham stimulation and inhibiting cues, sham stimulation and facilitating cues, active stimulation and inhibiting cues, and active stimulation and facilitating cues. And uh, during session, participants receive uh, CTBS brain stimulation, and after the brain stimulation, they had the opportunity to consume food in a test test. And this study showed that CTBS resulted in increased uh, food consumption in the presence of facilitative cues, but not in the presence of inhibiting cues. So in brief, this study actually suggested that uh, suggested a stronger CTBS effects in the presence of facilitative cues. So to summarize, both of these two studies suggested that if individuals have uh, lower executive function, it may result in uncontrolled uh, eating or uh, consumption of calorie dense food, which could lead to adiposity in the long run, higher adiposity in the long run. Okay, this is the last slide on brain aspirator perspective. Brain aspirator perspective, I just want to show you the findings from a meta-analysis here. So in that meta-analysis, uh, uh, it examined whether baseline executive function in children and adolescents can predict follow-up weight status. So this meta-analysis meta actually showed that if children have higher executive function at baseline, they, ten they tend to present with lower adiposity at follow-up. Okay, now let's discuss some, of, uh, some limitation of the previous research. So, there is a lack of research using large-scale population-based data sets. Uh, so if we consider brain aspector perspective, it is actually more true. So most of the brain aspector uh, studies are small-scale experimental studies. So ideally, by bidirectionally should be explored using large-scale population-based data set. So previous studies also had a number of limitations. Uh, most previous studies are unidirectional analysis on different samples. So basically, they examined either brain aspector path or brain as outcome path on different sample. Therefore, it is not clear whether uh, these two paths can happen simultaneously in an individual. And another limitation is lack of temporality. So a number of previous studies are uh, cross-sectional in nature. So therefore, we cannot actually comment on directionality of the association. Many previous studies are uh, previous studies have uh, sample size issues. So because of small sample size, those studies were uh, not sufficiently powered to detect the small to medium size effects. Previous studies also had lack of uh, measures uh, on focal variables. So previous studies, uh, they only examined very few uh, cognitive domains or uh, very few adiposity measures. Previous studies also had limitation in terms of potential confounders. So it is actually not clear uh, whether the association between adiposity and cognitive function is independent or just because of adiposity related comorbidities. Previous studies also did not uh, explore mediation path in detail. And there is positive of research on this topic in the Canadian context. In the Canadian context. So it is actually not clear whether the association reported in earlier studies can also be generalized for Canadian population.
Okay, based on the finding uh, from the literature, this is our conceptual diagram and the bidirectional association model that we try to explore in our series of studies on bidirectional association. So we actually anticipated that measures of cognitive function, for example, executive function, verbal memory, and reaction time is bidirectionally associated with the indicators of adiposity, such as BMI, waist circumference, waist uh, to hip ratio, and DXA. And we also anticipated that this association would be mediated through health status mediators, such as hypertension and diabetes, and lifestyle mediators, such as diet and exercise. So specifically for the brain as outcome perspective, uh, we anticipated that uh, this association would be mediated through health status mediators. So adiposity, it would lead to the development of uh, other health conditions, such as hypertension and diabetes, which in turn can, can cause cognitive dysfunction. And for the brain as predictor perspective, so cognitive dysfunction can lead to unhealthy lifestyle behavior, such as uh, improper diet, sedentary lifestyle, which could ultimately contribute to the development of uh, adiposity. And finally, we also expect that this association would be moderated by socioeconomic status because uh, individuals from high socioeconomic status, they have more flexibility and resources uh, on their dietary option and lifestyle behavior. Okay, now I'm going to discuss our study one. So uh, this study is a cross-sectional analysis of the baseline CLSA data set. So this study has been published in psychosomatic medicine. So let's talk about the objective and hypothesis of this study. So in this study, our objective was to examine the association between adiposity and cognitive function and test the potential mediation path. So we had several hypotheses. So our hypothesis is one that better score on test of cognitive function would be associated with lower adiposity. So our hypothesis two was that the bidirectional association, the aforementioned association are mediated through lifestyle behavior and medical condition. And finally, we uh, hypothesize that the aforementioned association would be stronger for those of higher socioeconomic status. Okay, now I'd like to give you some information about the CLSA data collection. I think uh, most of you already know about that. So CLSA is a long-term longitudinal uh, study. Uh, that started data collection in 2011 and first follow-up data collection, baseline data collection was completed in 2015 and first follow-up data collection was completed in 2018. So CLSA has two cohort, tracking cohort, which consists of uh, over 21,000 participants and CLSA comprehensive cohort, uh, which consists of over 30,000 participants. So at the time of our analysis, we only had baseline and first follow-up data sets were available. And for our analysis, we only used CLSA comprehensive cohort for, for our analysis. Okay, these are the study variables for study one. So our outcome variables are the adiposity indicators. So these are body, body mass index, uh, to, total fat mass measured by TXA, waist circumference, and waist to hip ratio. So our cognitive explanatory variables uh, where our cognitive uh, uh, indicators. So we selected Stroop task, choice reaction time task, and animal fluency task to represent our cognitive function. So we adjusted our analysis for major social demographic variables, such as age, sex, ethnicity, income, education, residence, physical activity. So for the comorbidity, we created somatic comorbidity index and neurologic comorbidity index and use those index uh, to adjust our analysis for comorbidity. So for mediators, uh, we selected uh, health condition like type two diabetes mellitus and hypertension as mediators. Uh, and for uh, lifestyle mediator, we selected physical activity, healthy and unhealthy diet as our mediators. Okay, now I'd like to give you, give you some information about the cognitive measures uh, we uh, used in our analysis. So first is Stroop task. So troop task measure executive function. So in troop task, uh, and there is two block congruent and incongruent block. So in the congruent in the congruent block, participants are provided with color name where color name and font name matches. For example, red is written in red ink. Uh, however, in the incongruent block, there is a mismatch between the color name and font name. For example, red is written in blue ink. 
So when there is a mismatch like that, the time required to identify color increase compared to the congruent condition. And this true interference is calculated by taking the difference in completion time between incongruent block and congruent block. And higher strip interference uh, indicates uh, lower executive function. Next is reaction time task. So uh, this task measures the speed of visual information processing. So in the task, participants sit in front of a uh, computer screen and they need to press a keyboard key in response to a visual stimuli on the screen. And higher uh, reaction time indicates lower processing speed. So next is animal fluency task. In that task, participants are asked to name as many animals uh, they can in one minute. And individuals who are, those are cognitively sound tend to produce more words compared to those who are not cognitively sound. And higher uh, in animal fluency task score indicate better verbal fluency. Okay, now let's move on to the statistical analysis. So for the study one, at first we conducted hierarchical multivariable uh, linear regression, and we assessed two models. So model one was the association between adiposity and the covariates, and model two was the association between adiposity and cognitive function uh, while controlling for the effects of covariate. So for the mediation analysis, we used lifestyle variable, uh, such as physical activity and diet and medical condition variables, such as type two diabetes mellitus and hypertension as potential mediators. And finally, we conducted moderation analysis uh, by income groups. Okay, let's move on to the results uh, for study one. So our analysis showed that higher cognitive function was associated with lower adiposity by most matrices. And we also observed uh, some significant mediation effects. Uh, uh, for example, for the association between stroop interference and adiposity, health conditions such as type 2 diabetes mellitus and hypertension emerged as a significant mediator. Next, we also observed uh, a significant moderation effect. So individuals from higher socioeconomic status individuals from higher socioeconomic status showed stronger effect compared to those uh, from lower socioeconomic status. Okay, that's all about study one. So study one showed that uh, cognitive function is associated with adiposity indices at the baseline level of the CLSA data. So our next, is, next step was to examine whether this association is bidirectional or not using CLSA uh, baseline and first follow-up data set. So this study has already been published in Journal of Gerontology Medical Sciences. Okay, now let's move on to the objective and hypothesis for study one. So for this study, our objective was to examine the bidirectional association between cognitive function and adiposity and examine the potential mediation path. So we hypothesized that cognitive function was bidirectionally associated with adiposity such that higher baseline cognitive function would be associated with lower fall of adiposity and vice versa. We also hypothesize that for the brain as outcome perspective, this association would be mediated through health status mediator, such as blood pressure and diabetes. And for the brain as predictor perspective, this association would be mediated through lifestyle mediators, such as diet and exercise. We also hypothesize that middle aged individual would have stronger effect compared to those of older adults, because older adults people are exposed to longer years of adverse effects of uh, adiposity and other comorbidities. Okay, let's move on to methods. So as adi adiposity indicators for this study, we used body mass index and waist circumference. So our cognitive indicators were stroop task, choice reaction time task, and animal fluency task. So we had same set of covariates, uh, age, sex, ethnicity, income, education, residence, physical activity, comorbidity, and sleep duration. For mediators, we used uh, type 2 diabetes, blood pressure, physical activity, healthy and unhealthy diets. So in that study, we applied some ex exclusion criteria. So basically those individuals whose first language was not English or French, so individuals who could not work without assistance or individuals who have uh, cognitive, uh, who have a brain disorder that may impact cognitive functions such as dementia, stroke, 
Parkinson's disease and multiple sclerosis, were excluded uh, from the baseline analysis, were excluded at baseline. So after applying this exclusion criteria, we had uh, approximately 26,000 participants at baseline. So few uh, participants were lost to follow up. So at wave two, we had a little over 24,000 participants available for the analysis. Okay, now let's move on to the statistical analysis for study two. So at first we conducted multivariate, multivariable regression, and then we conducted cross light panel model analysis with latent variable modeling. So this is the figure of cross light panel model. So we observed that adiposity indicators, BMI and uh, waist circumference are strongly correlated. So uh, we use these two as a latent adiposity construct. However, cognitive measures are poorly correlated. Uh, so basically, different cognitive measures are representing different cognitive domains. So therefore, we used cognitive measures separately in the analysis instead of uh, making a latent construct. So for mediation analysis, we used lifestyle variable and medical condition variable, and we stratified all our analysis by age group. So two broad age group, middle-aged and older adults. Okay, now let's move on to the results. So at first look at the findings of multivariate, multivariable regression. For the brain as outcome perspective, uh, in middle-aged adults, we observed that higher adiposity was associated with uh, higher stroke interference, that means lower executive function, and lower animal fluency task uh, performance, that is lower verbal fluency. So finding is similar for older adults, except that higher adiposity was associated with better verbal fluency. So it actually indicates that in older adults, adiposity provides some protective effects on verbal fluency. For brain as predictor perspective, we observed that higher stroke interference was associated with higher adiposity and higher animal fluency task performance was associated, associated with lower adiposity. Yeah, so we, our findings are in the expected direction. But in older adults, we did not observe any significant effect for brain as predictor perspective. Similar finding was emerged with cross light panel model analysis. So in that figure, a dotted line indicates middle-aged, uh, whereas solid line indicates older adults. So for the brain as predictor perspective, animal fluency was emerged as a significant outcome uh, in older adults for adiposity. Uh, but in a direction that suggests uh, adiposity provides some protection on verbal fluency, uh, stroop interference was emerged as a significant outcome in middle-aged adults. For brain as predictor perspective, only stroop interference was emerged as a significant predictor of adiposity, and but only in middle-aged adults, not in older adults. So we observed bidirectional association here you know, with stroop interference, that major executive function, and only in middle-aged, not in older adults. So next, move on to the mediation analysis. So for the brain as outcome perspective, uh, systolic and diastolic blood pressure and diabetes mellitus emerged as a significant uh, mediator. And for brain as predictor perspective, uh, diet and pastries emerged as a significant predictor. Okay, this slide is just to summarize the cross like panel model finding. So for stroop interference, Okay, in that figure, uh, solid line indicates statistically significant path and dotted line indicate non-significant path. So path B is the brain as outcome path and path C is the brain as predictor path. So for stroop interference, uh, both path B and both path C emerge as significant in middle-aged adults. So we observed bidirectional association here involving stroop interference and only in middle-aged. For animal fluency, in older adults, only the brain as outcome perspective emerged significant, uh, but in a direction that suggests adiposity provides some uh, protection on verbal fluency. And for mean reaction time, we did not observe any uh, significant effect. Okay, now let's move on to the general discussion. So I'll summarize the major findings from our study one and two. So for, uh, in study one, we observed that uh, better cognitive function is associated with lower adiposity by most matrices. 
for study two, we observed that in middle aged adults, adiposity is bidirectionally associated with ex executive function that is measured by Stroop task. In older adults, only a brain as outcome perspective emerged significant, such that higher adiposity was associated with better verbal fluency in older adults. For mediation analysis, we observed uh, significant um, mediation effect for lifestyle uh, variable and medical condition variable. Okay, now I'd like to show you some strength and limitations of our analysis. So let's discuss the strength first. So uh, we used large-scale population-based data sets in both of our study one and two, unlike many previous studies. Those are like small scale studies with a small number of participants and not sufficiently powered to detect small to medium size effects. And our study two is a longitudinal analysis. So we can actually comment about directionality here. So what is the effect of baseline cognitive function on follow-up adiposity and vice versa? So in our analysis, we used multiple indices of adiposity and cognitive function. So therefore, we can actually comment that. This association is not limited to one limited to any specific measures of adiposity or cognitive function. And we have uh, we had rich information on potential confounders, particularly the information on comorbidity. So we created comorbidity index and adjusted our analysis for those comorbidities. Okay, now let's move on to the limitations. So one major limitation is that prospective analysis were limited to only two waves of CLSA data. So as I mentioned. At the time of our analysis, we only had two waves of CLSA data, and two waves of data may not be sufficient to properly quantify the effect size. And another problem uh, was that shorter follow-up interval. So between baseline and first follow-up data set, there was just three years of gap, and it may not be sufficient to properly uh, quantify the cross-lack effects because uh, we are expecting a gradual accumulative uh, phenomena here. So the effects of adip adiposity on cognitive function and vice versa should be accumulated over time. So if we have uh, longer follow-up interval and more follow-up data, then we could actually uh, would see more stronger effect compared to what we get here. And although we have very large sample size, population representative uh, may not be perfect because we used only CLSA comprehensive cohort and as because CLSA comprehensive cohort participants uh, were recruited from the major urban center, it may not be entirely representative for whole Canadians. And finally, cognitive domains examined within CLSA were not exhaustive. So for cognitive function, we, uh, we use three domains, we assess three domains, and uh, for prospective analysis, we had like two adiposity measures. So future studies should actually examine uh, other cognitive domains using a comprehensive set of uh, adiposity indices. Okay, so our study to actually showed that there is bidirectional association between adiposity and executive function in middle aged adults. So uh, our next step was to examine whether this association uh, is also true for uh, adolescent population or not. So uh, we actually conducted this bidirectional association analysis in a sample of adolescent population uh, using ABCD data set. So I'll be showing you now some of our recent findings from the ABCD data analysis. So this study is conditionally accepted in JAMA Open and currently in review now. So at first, uh, I'd like to give you some information about the ABCD study. So ABCD is a multi-site longitudinal study in the United States. And this study recruited approximately 12,000 children ages 9 to 10 year. And this study began data collection in 2018. And at the time of our data analysis, we have wave one, two, three uh, data sets wide available. Okay, now discuss the variable and findings of our ABCD analysis. So cognitive indicators of this study are the cognitive task included in the NIH toolbox cognitive battery. So we actually included five cognitive tasks in our analysis. So these are flanker tasks that measure executive function, pattern matching tasks uh, that measure the speed of visual information processing, 
picture sequence task that measure episodic memory and picture vocabulary task and oral reading task. Adequacy indicators of this study uh, were BMI Z-score and West circumference. And we adjusted our analysis for major social demographic variables. So uh, for the results, so we conducted both multivariate multivariable regression and cross leg panel model analysis, just like our study too. For brain as uh, outcome perspective, we observed that higher BMI Z-score was associated with lower picture sequence task uh, performance that measure episodic memory and higher waist circumference was associated with better picture vocabulary task performance. For brain as predictor perspective, higher uh, Plankard task and picture sequence task performance was associated with lower adiposity. Similar finding was emerged with cross-select panel model analysis. So for brain as outcome perspective, uh, only pattern matching task and Plankard task emerged as a significant outcome for the adiposity. For brain as predictor perspective, uh, except the pattern matching task, Rest of the cognitive task emerged as a significant predictor uh, for adiposity. So we basically observed bidirectional association here using flanker task that measure executive function. Okay, this slide is just to summarize the cross select panel model finding uh, uh, for our ABCD data analysis. So uh, for the flanker flanker task and pattern matching task. Brain as outcome perspective emerged as a significant, and except pattern matching task, rest of the task emerged as a significant predictor for the brain as predictor perspective. So we observed uh, bidirectional association here using flanker task, but not with other tasks. So in the ABCD uh, data sets, we have brain morphology data uh, measured by structural MRI. So we used brain morphology uh, as a mediator in our analysis, and we observed a few uh, significant mediation effects here. So for the brain as outcome perspective, uh, several brain morphology emerged as a significant mediator, for example, middle frontal gyrus thickness, um, inferior frontal gyrus thickness, and the volume of middle frontal gyrus and the volume of lateral uh, prefrontal cortex. For the brain as predictor perspective, only the thickness of uh, lateral prefrontal cortex emerges as a significant predictor. Okay, so I'd like to wrap up by showing some implications and future directions here. So one of our limitation was that we had only two weeks of data and only three years of follow-up interval. So future studies should employ longer prospective data collection interval to more conclusively characterize the magnitude of cross select effects, ideally 10 years or more. So if we have like multiple waves of uh, follow-up data and sufficiently enough follow-up interval, then we would see more stronger effect because we are expecting a accumulative nature of uh, accumulative nature here. The next is explore the extent of bidirectionality using other cognitive domains. So in our analysis, we were able to include few cognitive domains, but future studies should include other cognitive domains, for example, memory, attention, and we should see whether uh, those have any bidirectionality or not. So for our prospective analysis and also for our ABCD data, we were limited to use only BMI and West circumference. So Feature study should use a comprehensive set of adiposity measures, uh, particularly uh, DXA, which is considered as a gold, gold standard for fat mass assessment. So in our ABCD analysis, we used brain morphology as a mediators only. So feature studies should also explore the bidirectionality using brain morphology features and functional neuro imaging. So in our both ABCD and CLS analysis, we observed a bidirectional association using executive function. So we should actually explore the utility of executive function training in eating and weight loss intervention, particularly for those who have undergone bariatric surgery. And explore the novel method of enhancing executive function using TMS. 
So TMS is a non-invasive brain stimulation technology uh, that uh, can be used to enhance executive function. So future studies should also explore uh, this kind of no novel method. Okay, that concludes my presentation. So I would like to take this opportunity to express my gratitude to my supervisor, Dr. Peter Hall, for his constant support and guidance throughout my doctoral studies and also supporting me now as a postdoctoral researcher in his lab. I'm very thankful uh, to my collaborators, Dr. Reza Ramazan, Dr. John Best, and Dr. Mary Thompson for extending their expertise in statistical analysis. So I'm also thankful to all the participants and researchers associated with the CLSA and ABCD data sets. So for making these uh, amazing resources for the researcher. And I'm also thankful to all the current and uh, previous uh, member of the Prevention Neuroscience Laboratory. So it's really great to work with such a great group of people. Okay, thank you everyone for your attention today and listen patiently. So we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Thank you. Hey, well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Sakib and Dr. Hall. Uh, I don't know if you, Dr. Hall, did you have anything you wanted to add before we move into questions or are you just the uh, silent partner today? <laughs> Mostly the the silent partner. Okay. Unless you unless uh, there are any specific questions that I can um, add my perspective. Well, I'll just remind everyone to use the Q and A box down at the bottom of the screen to post any questions. Um, I just uh, want to say I think this is a great example of a uh, of use of longitudinal data and and a platform like the CLSA as we get more follow up data. Um, I think, you know, having that 10 year minimum um, span to to be able to look at issues like this in the aging process is, you know, that's just the that's the power of it. So I think that's a that's a just a great example of this. So we do have one question from uh, Basma Ahmed. Uh, great talk. Did you consider looking into depression, uh, di either diagnosis or treatment as a covariable in your analysis? knowing the relation between depression and cognitive impairment, especially in older adults? So in terms of depression, I think we created comorbidity index, and I think depression was one of the conditions that we included uh, in our comorbidity index. So we actually already adjusted our, our analysis for uh, depression and some, uh, I think, many chronic diseases. So in our comorbidity, comorbidity index, so we had somatic comorbidity index that includes, I think, 22 comorbidities and neurologic comorbidity that includes four uh, neurologic comorbidities. So uh, our analysis are already adjusted for uh, some of those uh, comorbidities. Great. Um, lots of compliments on your presentation today. So uh, really great job. So uh, Laura Anderson here at McMaster um, would like to know, what did you do with people who are underweight and could there be a U-shaped association? Mm, could you please repeat it again? Uh, what did you do with people who are underweight and could there be a U-shaped association? So for our ABCD analysis, so now we actually uh, do a sensitivity analysis by removing uh, those who are like underweight. Uh, and we actually did not uh, find any significant difference uh, between these two analysis, like main analysis and analysis after excluding those like underweights. So findings are almost uh, like similar. So yeah, we actually checked uh, our analysis uh, with underweight and without underweight. So uh, there is not much difference in the findings. So th this is certainly, you know, a valid point and, and something that we have has been on our radar for both um, sets of analysis, you know, the idea that um, people who are underweight um, uh, may have because un severe underweight is associated with um, cognitive performance decrements on uh, some of these tasks in other research, both in um, older adults and in uh, young adolescents and adolescents. Um, and so in ABCD, as Nasma has pointed out, we did um, do a sensitivity analysis, um, removing those who are underweight and did not actually affect the uh, pattern of findings. Um, I honestly, I cannot recall what we did with this 
with CLSA specifically, um, we may have to get back to you. It seems to me we discussed this and tried something um, to deal with it. I'm not totally sure if that ended up in the the reported um, paper or not, but certainly it's a it's a good point. Something that needs to be considered uh, when um, considering adiposity and uh, cognitive function. Uh, next question is, was there a way to account for acute issues such as sleep deprivation, um, uh, that day's diet, um, stress that may have affected cognitive ability? Also, was BMI a single point or is length of time with BMI considered? Might be easier to read that question in, in the Q&A. So uh, in terms of sleep deprivation, like it's a like a really good point. So sleep deprivation, it could affect like cognitive function as well as it has shown association with adiposity in literature. So in our study one, we did not uh, adjust it for sleep deprivation, but for our study two and our ABCD analysis, we use sleep duration as a co-period. And I think we accounted uh, uh, for those in our analysis already. And what is the other part of the question? Um, was... Stress. Stress as a second covariate. I'm not, I believe we did not. Yeah, we did not uh, actually uh, adjust our analysis for stress, I believe, yeah. Okay, okay hopefully that answers the question. Um, there's a question that, uh, um, just a reminder to put the questions in the Q&A box, but I do see a question from Cynthia in the uh, chat box, so we'll ask that. Um, she's wondering if you looked at any blood-based biomarkers. I don't think I saw that in your presentation, but maybe you, maybe I missed it, or maybe you've done other work. Yeah, yeah. So in our, uh, like, in our data set, we actually did not have blood biomarkers. So like in future, actually, uh, we would like to check other mediation path, for example, uh, metabolic syndrome, and uh, we'd like to see uh, the blood biomarker and how it's linked with adiposity and cognitive function. So it, it's something we want to do in future. Um, so we have a follow-up question about the BMI. Was BMI a single point or was length of time with BMI considered? That was the second part of the question we didn't answer. So I'm not sure if I understood this question properly. So BMI was collected at baseline data sets, I think as a single point collection. And also uh, in the first follow-up data set, BMI was uh, collected. And we used uh, BMI of, in our prospective analysis, we used BMI of like first follow-up data set and BMI of like, uh, BMI of baseline and BMI of first follow-up data set we used is uh, in our analysis as a, like uh, our focal variable in our adiposity indicator as our adiposity yeah. indicator. So I, I think, um, you know, certainly with um, more follow-up intervals and a greater time lag, total time lag between baseline and, and final measurement, we'll have an opportunity to, you know, more comprehensively ad address this question where we can actually approximate how much time someone may have lived with, with BMI. Uh, but we did um, examine this um, implicitly and almost explicitly uh, in our discussion of how to interpret the findings of the ABCD study, which involves um, a nine and 10 year olds at baseline versus uh, CLSA, which is older adults. And we found more evidence of uh, bidirectionality in the older adult sample, uh, sorry, in the middle aged adult. Uh, sorry, the middle-aged segment of the CLSA uh, compared to the adolescents who have really it's the brain as predictor uh, pathway that's that's most consistent. And so um, the way that we discussed those findings was that there, for adolescents, um, there may be less evident brain health impacts of adiposity prospectively uh, because they haven't lived with obesity very long. So, you know, we may have kids who have lived with it from, you know, months to years, not decades or more. Whereas, you know, by middle-aged people have potentially been obese for, you know, years to decades. And so you'd be more likely to see 
prospective effects of obesity on the brain when it's been, you know, kind of on the scene longer like that. So I think, yeah, we haven't sort of integrated that. I think the data limits our ability to do that um, in, in terms of a direct test of that, but in terms of comparing those different age groups is certainly uh, um, how we conceptualize the difference in terms of, you know, where you say, see the brain health impacts and where you don't in terms of age range. Thank you. Well, I think that is all the questions. Um, if anybody has any additional follow-up questions that you think of, I'm sure you could, you can definitely email the CLSA and we will follow up with our presenters, or um, I believe the emails of Dr. Sakib were, and Dr. Hall were included. Um, so I will wrap things up um, by just thanking you again for um, your excellent uh, presentation. Again, lots of positive comments about the presentation of your slides and, and ease of understanding them. So I think you did a great job on that and our uh, participants appreciate that. Um, I'd like to remind everyone that the that the next data access application deadline is January 18th of 2023. Uh, please visit our CLSA website under data access to review available data, as well as additional details about the application process. Uh, registration for our January CLSA webinar will be posted on our website um, at some point early in January. Uh, we actually do not have a, a topic confirmed for that webinar yet, so stay tuned for that. Um, and finally, remember that the CLSA promotes this webinar series using the hashtag CLSA webinar, and we invite you to follow us also on Twitter at, at CLSA underscore ELCV. And I hope everybody has a, a restful holiday season, uh, whatever you may be doing over the next few weeks, and we will see you in the new year.